that I'm going to ask you to turn to two portions of scriptures, one in Leviticus 20 and the other one in Romans chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. And then we're going to go to Romans 1, verses 24 through 28. Verse 13 says, If a man also lie with womankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them and then in Romans chapter 1 beginning from verse number 24 wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the cre creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving to themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind to do those things which were, which are not convenient. And I'm going to talk tonight about the Bible and homosexuality and so God bless you and you may be seated some years ago probably about three years or so I dealt with this same subject and over the next few months I'm going to be repeating most of what I said back then we do it at least once a month this this thing is is really um, something that we cannot av avoid at all this is important because I know over the last year or so this subject really has taken over the spiritual climate of this country I believe that the current administration in Washington has done more damage to the spiritual fabric of this nation than any previous administration in recent history. What is called the, the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender lobby has really hijacked the direction of this country, which is very unfortunate. This is also becoming true in other countries. And what we, what we should realize is that the end of this age is on us, and the devil has really launched an onslaught against anything that is godly, anything that is moral, anything that is right, anything that's biblical. And this country is really slouching towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, we know what judgment that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities in the plains. So we can rest assured that we need to know that the same judgment that was given to Sodom and Gomorrah is, of course, is going to be waiting for this country. It's a very sad thing. Um, if God did not judge this nation as he did Sodom and Gomorrah, then 
he would really have to wake up those people there and apologize to them. And of course, we know God is not going to do anything, anything like that. And so we should know then that at the very um, near, in the very near future, that there is a judgment for this nation. It's, it's unavoidable. And we've got leaders that are really taking us to that precipice. And we need to, we need to distance ourselves from anything that is unrighteousness and wickedness. And uh, I know that it's really under the guise then of being politically correct that these God-defined people feel that, they should, that we should say nothing against their sinful lifestyle and their perversion. They feel like, well, since they're perverted, everybody should accept it. However, the church of the living God is really not going to do that because we have a clear, a clear teaching in the word of God relative to that kind of sinful lifestyle. And because of that, we would be derelict in our duty if we did not sound a clarion call to this world and this nation to let them know where God stands. Because you've got, you've got many in some call, so church, so-called churches that is not really going to say anything against that kind of lifestyle. Furthermore, they have been in cahoots with that. And it is because it is just those those places are really man-made places. And uh, these people are really God-defying. They're defying God, but rest assured that they will not escape the judgment of God. Just this very week, we had one basketball player who has come out and declared himself to be a homosexual. Now, I don't really care about these folk. I mean, I, I don't really care what he is. He doesn't have to tell me. I mean, if there's a thief in the place, I, they don't have to tell me that they're a thief. I, I'm, not, I'm not interested if you're a thief. Because now suppose, I mean, I've been cheating on my, my income tax return. It'd be foolish for me to go on television or go on the radio or pay something on the Facebook to say that, well, I've been robbing the IRS over the years. I mean, I mean, common sense would tell you that they will come after you unless you're a fool. But for, for, for people to really to come out and to declare that they're homosexual, I mean, I mean, give us a break now. We don't, we don't really care who these folks are. I don't, I don't care. And when they have this kind of things to themselves, they need to keep it someplace and not really just shake it in God's face because you simply can't take God on and win. That, that, is, that is a battle you simply will not win. It, you, 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 there's nothing good that's going to come out of that. If God is telling you don't do it and you are defying God and really spitting in God's face, that is not good, friend. You need to keep your mouth shut and keep all of that foolishness among yourself. And uh, when I heard some of the reaction, I mean, it was quite alarming. Some people portrayed this young man as a hero. Well, if you're going to call him a hero, then we have to redefine that word and get a new word for what we've talked about, heroes in times past. Because he is no hero to come out and say you're homosexual. He's no hero, you're a fool. I mean, you need to keep that to yourself. Nobody cares about you. I mean, it's not like you're somebody. So it, it, it just, it, it is just, and then the president add his uh, remarks to that, which is really supporting that kind of thing and praising that kind of thing. That is just preposterous for a man that is supposedly learned and supposed to be going to church. Now, if you know about the Bible, which is what most Christian 
church is used as far as I know, then you ought to know where God stands and you simply cannot go toe to toe with God and win. It just doesn't work like that. And so for a man that leads this country to come and align himself and, and say that, you are just, just God defined. You are, you are just doing some things that you simply cannot sustain. You cannot do that. Because the Bible said in Ecclesiastes, just because judgment is not executed speedily against an evil work, then the hearts of men are set to do evil. But it doesn't mean you're going to do it perpetually. There is a season of grace. The apostle Peter said in Second Peter, he says that the long suffering of God is working, working really God's mercy toward us. But that is not, is not going to be perpetually God's mercy. There comes a time when God's mercy comes to an end. And when and mercy comes to an end, judgment falls. And so I, I hope people somewhere along the line will not be brazenly defying God because they simply are fighting something that is going to have some bad and serious consequences in the long run. And so it just, th th this country, Lord have mercy, we, we started out well. Paul said, he, Paul said, who, who did really hinder you from obeying truth? Because we had godly men that started this country, men that probably didn't have truth, but they had some godly principles. They were guided by some kind of mores. They were guided by some kind of right and wrong. But we've got a generation that have totally lost their way on the road to hell. And somebody says proverbially that we're going, this country's going to hell in a handbasket. And that is precisely what is happening to our world. If we don't get a hold of ourselves, if we don't get a hold of our intellect, if we don't get a hold of, of something and get a hold of the horns of the altar, then this country is just looking at the judgment of God. And I'm, you know, this is why us, the church of the living God, we're glad when we get up out of this place here because the things that is going to happen to this world and specifically this country is just not good at all. Jesus said to him that knows to do well and doesn't do it, he's going to be beaten with many stripes. This country, there are more Bibles in this country than probably the entire world put together. There are more preachers that are in currently here that have been produced by this country than probably the entire world put together. So there is no excuse that they don't know the word of God. There is no excuse that they don't, have not been exposed to the word of God. There is no excuse that they can't find what the word of God says. And, uh, and because of that then, the judgment of this country is going to be much harsher than those that have preceded it. So tonight I'm going to look at three things, and I trust then that somewhere along the line it'll be indelibly ingrained in our hearts and in our mind the thing that God has to say relative to this particular subject that is really at work in this country, probably everywhere you go. There is some vestiges of this kind of subject or overtly or 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 just 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 in in your window it's there i mean you look sometime even on our public television it's there and people just just we have lost our way but let me let, let us look at three things tonight and and see what might be at the root of this and what we can do and so over the as i said over the next several months i'll mention it probably on this um first uh, Wednesday of the month and and just kind of keep that in people's memory just because just like they have all that foolishness going on there got to be something that say here is what we need to do so firstly the biggest problem that we faced that we face right now in regards to this subject and others but specifically this subject is a devaluation of God's eternal word or an outright rejection of God's word. If, if we value the word of God 
And if we believe the word of God, then certainly we could not have taken such a left turn. We, should, we could not have taken such a turn that our children are at risk. I look at our children today that are going to school, in public school, and, and we're going we're gonna to have to fight to somehow debunk them, to deprogram them, to get out all of the junk that the public school system is putting in their head. Teachers are doing it. Educators are doing it. The whole school board is doing it. Putting all of this junk in their head. And we have defied God. And friend, it's got to be that they don't believe the word of God or they feel like the word of God has no value. On the issue of homosexuality, for instance, the scriptures are abundantly clear. The scripture has one voice. There are no gray areas in scripture relative to homosexuality. There are no ambiguities. There are no vacillation in any of the writers. There are no equivocation there. There are no uncertainties that are put in the word of God. It is abundantly clear. A fool could understand it. A blind person could read it. A dumb person could talk it out. So there is no excuse. God's word, God's word is clear on this issue. It is unanimous. The scriptures are unanimous in the condemnation, both in the Old Testament texts and the New Testament text. It has one voice. There is, there's not, there's not a gray area. There's not an area that well, maybe there's a little bit doubt. No, there's no area. There's, there, there's both, both. All the New Testament speak with one voice. So, what is the problem then? If the scriptures are clear, if it is plain as night and day, why do we have that problem? Why are churches, I mean, supposedly churches, they're wrestling with it. They're, they're having... They're having their ministers and their priests openly gay and serving as clergy, as they call them. I mean, for the most part, those people say they believe in the Bible. For the most part, they read the Bible. For the most part, they say they believe in God. Well, how if the scriptures are clear and they say they believe in God, what is the problem? I mean, if God says red and you believe God, it stands to reason that everybody should say red. Now, if you don't believe God, then you can say blue or yellow. But if you believe God, you have to agree with God. The Bible says in, in 2 Thessalonians, he says, we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. We can't, we can't suddenly change truth into a lie and then expect God is going to change. See, God doesn't change because man change. God, God doesn't, God simply does not, cannot, will not change. He's not going to solve and say, well, you know, I did say you shouldn't lie, but because so many people are lying, well, I think it's okay. God not about to do that. If God said lying is wrong, it meant when you get up in the morning, it's wrong. When you go to bed, it's wrong. If you're young, it's wrong. If you're old, it's wrong. If you're, if you're fat, it's wrong. If you're thin, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is settled. So God is not about to change his mind just because people want him to be political or correct. We need to know that God is not just going to suddenly change his mind. God already has a church in the grave. If people, if all people backslide today, God already has a church in the grave. Peter is in the church. Paul is in the church. Mary's in the, God has a church in the ground. He doesn't really need us. His word has been vindicated by changed lives. So when all of these folks in these so-called churches are wrestling with this idea and changing 
and 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 consecrating openly gay people to serve as their priest and their preacher they have lost their collective minds they have gone out of the way they have become enemies of God. They may say they're still preachers. They may say they're still priests. But they are enemies of the living God. God has a fight with them. God is going to wrestle with them. And friend, that is a fight they cannot win. They're not going to win that fight. They can't win that war. They're going to lose that battle. If you're going to try and defy God. Well, you, I, I'll watch. I'll just sit back here and watch who's going to win. You know, because some folk think they're real smart. Some of these folk graduate from Harvard and Yale. Oh, you're smart. The pointy head, the geeks, they feel they're smart. But you, you, you're not smarter than God now. Let me, let me remind you who made who. So, what? is the problem if God is has declared his mind why are preachers why are priests why are religious leaders wrestling with this idea the the simple reason is they have devalued the word of God they say gray doesn't mean gray anymore Black doesn't mean black anymore. White doesn't mean white anymore. Well, I know God said that, but God was kind of drunk. He had taken a little bit of drugs. He had maybe smoked marijuana. He, he'd probably taken a hit of crack. And so he wasn't really thinking straight. But here is what God means. Friend, stop. God's word need to be valued. David said, more to be desired are they than gold. Yea, that much fine gold. They are sweeter than the honey, than the honeycomb. He says, moreover, this Psalms 19, moreover by them is thy servant warned. And in keeping of them, there is great reward. So we should not devalue the scriptures of God, the scripture that God has left for us, that he is preserved because they're infallible, they're inerrant, and they're, they're, they're inspired. The apostle Peter said that holy men of God wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. The apostle Paul said they are inspired, they're God breathed. So if they came out of the mind of God, no man has the, the ability, no man has the, the right to change it. But we need to acquiesce in what God is saying. We need to agree with God. We need to line up with God. We need to sign on the dotted line with God. We can't go up against God and win that. Not the God of the Bible. I mean, you can win, you can beat Buddha, you can knock down Allah, but you simply cannot win a fight with God. You can't. We must really always remember in order to go to heaven we have got to believe the word of God the word of God, the revealed word of God is the only thing that tells us about heaven nobody as far as I know during this dispensation has gone to heaven we only get to heaven by obeying believing in the word of God we need to believe the word of God and that is what is going to get us into heaven one simply cannot override God's word and still be saved. You simply cannot override the word of God and feel like you're still going to heaven. You're not going to heaven. You know, people can try and, and deceive themselves. Well, you know, you know, God, God give me latitude. I can, you know, one, 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 one man told me that. That, that one of the, their, their leader was infallible. So whatever he says, that's what goes. And so if he, if, if he, if he contradict God, well, you know, well, he's infallible. So he can override God. And, you know, people just have lost their minds. 
I mean, do we believe the Bible or don't we? Well, if we believe the Bible, we've got to line up where the Bible lines up. If it says thus and so, it's thus and so. In Psalms 119, verse 89, here's what the psalmist says. He says, forever, O God, thy word is settled in heaven. In Matthew 24, 35, Jesus stood to his feet and he said, heaven and earth would pass away, but my word shall not pass away. The apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, verse 4, he says, what, what, what? if some did not believe does that make the word of God of none effect he says absolutely not let God be true and every man a liar James chapter 1 verse 17 says that with God there is no there is no variableness or shadow of turning so with God there's no change the writer in the Hebrews chapter 13 verse 80 said Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever God is the same in Malachi chapter 3, the Bible said, I'm God, I change not. So we cannot, we simply cannot let God be like a, a yo-yo. The scripture doesn't portray God as a yo-yo. And let's not have a yo-yo God. The apostolic God is a God that is solid, doesn't change. He's like, he's like an iron bar. You can't bend him, can't shape him, you just have to accept him. So church leaders, I'm not sure what they're thinking. Our church leaders, are those guys, those supposedly priests, I mean, are they on cheap drugs? I mean, I mean, if you have the real stuff, at least after that, why not? Why not? At least you're back to your real mind. But this cheap drugs is killing them. They just, they just lost their minds. I don't know what they're mixing it with, with flour or vinegar or what. I don't know what they're mixing it, but they're mixing it with something that has gotten to their mind and has and has 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 done something to their mind. I mean, men who say they're men of the cloth, you know, that's what they call themselves. And I don't know what that means, men of the cloth. Cloth. I mean, they need to be buried in. You know, they wind them up and bury them. That's what that cloth is, because they've lost their minds unbelievable but when people begin to devalue the word of God then that's what happened they will set aside God's word and then put in their own findings and put in their own postulation put in their own thoughts and own ideas when they start to say well you know God said that word of God said that but really that's not what God meant well, how do we know what God meant if it's not in the word? Are you going to change it, in it at any time you feel like? I mean, that's just foolishness. But wasn't this the same kind of mindset that upset our Lord when he was here? If you look quickly in Mark's gospel, chapter 7, beginning with verse 6. Jesus got real upset with some of those leaders. He answered and said unto them, well has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me? And you notice now, he didn't say they weren't worshiping him, but it was in vain. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men, for laying aside the commandment of God, and that is precisely what these priests and leaders are doing. Laying aside the command of God, you hold the tradition of men. I, 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 I went to visit one priest uh, some years ago. I had a church on Nebraska, and, and in talking with him, I wanted to try and learn what was it that governed that church. What did they use to run that church? What did they use to guide that church? What were the principles? Where did, they, where did they find the principles and law that ran that church? And to my surprise, that priest said, well, in, in this church, two things run it. It was a Roman Catholic church. He said, two things run it. First, tradition. And then secondly, scriptures. And I was kind of, I mean, you, you, apostolic would never, ever say that, even if, even if they were sleeping. Apostolic always appealed to scripture. 
But he said tradition and scripture were the guiding principle in that church. So I said, now, what happened when there's a conflict? What happened when tradition is in conflict with scripture? He says, when that happens, then tradition will override the scripture. And I said, I know you lost your mind. I mean, people, I mean, it was preposterous to say that, that you can allow tradition. And when they're talking about tradition, you know, they're talking about things like, well, tradition talk about purgatory. Well, you, well, Mr. Priest, purgatory not in scripture. Well, tradition override it because our tradition says there is a purgatory. And then they have the audacity to feel like they're going to heaven. I mean, if they had said, well, we know we're going to hell and we have this foolishness, I'll say, okay, well, I mean, that, that's all right. But they will, they, they, will, they will somehow make an argument to go to heaven. I wonder which heaven. It can't be the heaven that Jesus is saying is preparing. It can't be the heaven that I intend to go to. Certainly not the heaven that Paul is. People just, I mean, I don't know what has happened. I mean, I, I don't know what is in the air. I mean, some must be something that has, a, has gotten a hold of people's mind that they have just become just, just not even logical. I mean, you're doing all of that crazy stuff. Jesus said, don't do it. And they said, well, yeah, yeah, we know we're defying God, but, you know, we're still going to heaven. Okay, I wish you the best. But we got to value scripture. This is why the people of God, apostolic, have to value scripture. The first thing that something comes up, we say, well, let's go to the scripture. Jesus said in, in, in John chapter 5, 39, he said, search the scriptures because it is in them you have eternal life. You can't find any eternal life in some men's book, in some philosophical thought, in something that's been promulgated by men. No, you got to search the scriptures. That's where eternal life is. That's how you know how to get saved. That's how you know how to get heaven. You can't find going to heaven anywhere else. The Pope doesn't know how to get to heaven. Archbishop of Canterbury doesn't go know how to get to heaven. People that sing 40 years in the, in the, in the choir loft doesn't know how to get to heaven. you got to search the scripture. Here is how you get to heaven. So when somebody comes up with some idea, the first thing I'm looking to is what does the word of God say? So when people are going to come with something other than what the word of God says, I, they've got a problem right there. They've got, we've got a problem right there, friend. If you're going to come and I'm going to read from the word of God and it says something and you're telling me something else, we have a problem. We have got a problem. And some people, you know, they feel like, well, you know, church, these, these apostolics, you know, they're not politically correct. They need to bend with the, the time. We need to, we need to, Go with the time and be be nice and, and and be friendly and be tolerant, tolerate all kind of foolishness. Now we need to understand one thing. Um, when that happens, people people really doesn't have a problem with me. It's not me the problem is with, is the word of God. They have a problem with the word of God. And if you have a problem with the word of God, then you have a problem with God. And then you gotta go and take it up with God. Then you go and try and punch God out. That's what you've got to do. You don't, don't have to say anything about me. I'm just reading the word. It was here long before I got here. So people go in some error because they devalue the word of God. Secondly, if you cannot use the clear teachings on, homosexu on homosexuality to show that it is sinful, then you simply cannot use the Holy Scripture to make any case for anything else. Because the same Scripture that tells you that homosexuality is wrong is the same Bible that say God so loved the world. So if you're going to use John 3.16, then you've got to use what we read in Leviticus and what we read in Romans. Same Scripture, same God. 
So if you can't use it to teach against homosexuality, then you cannot use the scripture to teach anything else. So then you just have to get rid of the Bible. But friend, God has preserved the Bible. And the Bible said in keeping of them, there is great reward. The teachings in scripture against homosexuality is so pervasive and so absolute that if you can't use it to show that it is wrong, then you cannot use the scripture to show that idolatry is wrong or thieving is wrong or fornication is wrong or adultery is wrong or wickedness is wrong or witchcraft is you can't use it but if you can use it against those things that you certainly can use to teach against homosexuality sound doctrine that cannot be condemned and preachers apostolic preacher do not have to be politically correct because we serve god we're not, we're, not, we're not a man-made institution. We have, we're not subject to the laws of men when it comes to spiritual things. The Bible says, the apostle Peter says, Sir, we must obey God rather than men. The teaching against homosexuality is one of the core value scriptures. We know that it is core value and that it is held as an absolute because that such a lifestyle is pursued. If people pursue such a lifestyle, it will result in punishment in the lake of fire. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. If they pursue a, a homosexual lifestyle, hell is the ultimate destination. There's, no, there's, there's not a shadow of doubt in my mind or in the scripture's mind or in the real church's mind if you live like that and don't repent then you hell you're going to end up you can tell me you were born that way and you can accuse God for making you that way but it's still not going to stand up in the court of God's law not going to and if you pursue it then hell is going to be your portion now the Bible said that God is opening his hand to every man to repent so that the, the liar, the thief, the whoremonger, the proud, all of those have a chance to repent just like the homosexual because they're all sinful lifestyle. However, in the book that we read in Leviticus, it brings it up a notch relative to homosexuality. Not only is it wrong, not only is it sinful, but is an abomination. And friend, when you get that road, when you get to abomination, you, you have crossed the line. And people simply need to change. When we look at Paul's discussion in part of the text that we read, he begins it in the 18th verse. And it really is a discussion that centers around homosexuality. He said the wrath of God is revealed against it. Why is God against homosexual? Why is he so adamant? Why is he so adverse against it? I mean, even aside from logic. Even aside from logic, because now, let us just be logical for just one minute. Suppose now, Adam was homosexual. What would happen? And, and then suppose now, suppose Cain and Abel and, and Seth that replaced Abel. Suppose they were homosexual. Suppose those homosexuals out there now, suppose their mom and dad were homosexuals. You know, I mean, just out of plain logic will tell you that homosexuality is a, is a deviant lifestyle. You can't, you can't, there is not one argument that, that will remain plausible because there's no sense in it. People need to know that it's simply a deviant and wicked lifestyle and we've gone that way, but God will repent. So all of them need to come before God in contrition and in repentance and say, God, we have been wicked and estranged, but we're asking for pardon. Simple as that. Because logic, you cannot use logic. Human species would have been extinct. And maybe, you know, in a sense, well, 
I shouldn't say maybe it would be good if we were extinct. We won't want that, but at least they would be extinct. But, you know, you, 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 there's no good, logical, plausible reason to even feel like it, it's, it's something that is good. Because it, there would be no... How would you, how would you procreate the, the species? How, how, would you, how would you multiply the Lord's command to Adam and Eve was be fruitful and multiply. Now, how could he say that to two men? I mean, wouldn't God be stupid if he, if he had Adam and Steve? Say it was Adam and Steve. Okay, Adam and Steve, go, go on, be fruitful. Well, how, you, how is Adam and Steve going to be fruitful? I mean, isn't that real silly? Some, some people just degenerate into being silly that they just you, you just just have to shake your head and walk away because if you answer them you become a fool because the Bible says if you argue with a fool you become a fool so just shake your head scratch your head and just walk away there's no point is even saying anything and so the main thing why God is so totally opposed to it is because it destroys his image. Homosexuality destroys the image of God. It's a, it's a, it's a clear choice, I believe, that people make. God did not make them like that. I mean, it would be the same thing as arguing that if you're a crack addict, that God made you a crack addict. So, well, I can't stop. You know, when you say you can't stop, I bet if they lock you up in a, in a, in a room by yourself, you'll stop. You know, people just say silly things, and I'm just persuaded that people just, just they're just not really sensible. There's some, something has gotten into their mind, and the devil... Now, the, the Bible says the devil is the prince of the power of the air now. And so the devil has all kind of stuff in the air, and people just buy into that. And they, they go into some area that the devil has, as it were, put them in, and they just lost their mind. When God looks at a man and a woman, he sees his image. That image is absent with two of the same. So when God made Adam... You, you need to know that Eve came out of Adam. And so when God sees those two people, he sees his image. Because man was made in God's image. God cannot find his image in two men being a couple. And even in nature, that is uh, that's aberrant. It's, it's just not, it's not even pervasive in nature. Where you've got two, two male, like two male bulls or or two cocks, if you will, if you are two roosters. I mean, it, 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 this is just just so illogical. But but sometimes when people have gone off the deep end, even stuff that's illogical makes sense to them. But God certainly, God certainly is consistent, and He never changes. And thirdly, why then do people disagree so violently? As to, the, as to the fact that homosexuality is wrong. Why do, they, why do people disagree so much? Why do they, at one time they may have agreed and then all of a sudden they change. Why, why do they, people disagree? Some people may agree. Um, it was just recently our, the, this, the one senator, the Democratic senator um, from this state, he, he had said, well, you know, he... Uh, I think then marriage should be between one man and woman. And then the very next day, the very next day said, well, I've rethought it. And I think it's, it's all right if you have same-sex marriage. The, the thing that drives this country is the homosexual agenda. And so it put pressure on people. It, it, there is a there is a pressure, there's a political pressure on people to say the right things. 
I don't have to say the right thing. I just have to be Bible right. People don't have to agree with me. You can disagree, you can disagree with God, but I know God is going to vindicate those that stand with his word. So I don't have to, I don't have to be right in people's eyes. I just have to be right because I work for God. So the senator, he is elected and, and, uh, and, and he can be voted in, voted out. You can't vote God in and out. God is God by himself. So if you have an issue with God, you're going to lose every time. Hallelujah. God owns everything. Psalms 24, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. John, in John chapter 1, the Bible said he was in the world. The world was made by him. So you can't, you can't fight God. And you can fight him, but you're not going to win. And that's a, that's a fight I'm not going to get involved with, to fight God. Because I know I can't win. So why do people then have this, have this, this today, I for, today I'm against it, and next week I'm for it. What is at work? It is because of their experience. That's what's happening. That is exactly what's happening. It is because of their experience. You think about it. It's because of what they've experienced. They're not using scripture. They're not using scripture because if you use scripture every time it's going to be wrong. So they're not appealing to scripture. They're not about to ready to, to read what the Bible says. But it's because of their experience. How so? They know someone that is a homosexual. They have a relative that's homosexual. They have a daughter or a son that's homosexual. They know a neighbor that is homosexual. So all of a sudden, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's, no, I don't think it's wrong. It's because the kid's homosexual. Well, do you think God is wrong then? Because, I mean, somebody's got to be wrong. Because it was wrong Last year, it was wrong 2,000 years ago. It's wrong today. It doesn't change. Wrong is wrong. And right is right. So if, if the senator had believed it was wrong a couple of days before, and then all of a sudden he's changed, what do you mean? Truth can change? I mean, truth not absolute anymore. Truth is just situational. Truth can be good today and bad tomorrow. Well, no. God's truth doesn't change. If, 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 if it says this, then it's got to be this. God can't change. Because he upholds the world because his word is unchangeable. God can't, even if God wanted to change, he couldn't change. He said he's elevated the word above his name. And so the reason why people change is because of somebody they know who has come out and said they're gay. And all of a sudden, when your kid said, come out and said they're gay, then you don't want to go, you don't want them to go to hell, do you? So I said, oh, it should be fine. But just because you said it's fine, the word said it's wrong. So what you said has no, has no relevant to heaven or hell. It, your word doesn't amount to a raw pin or a hill of beans. Your word is like garbage. Don't matter. But God's word that said it's wrong is always there. If God is against it, then friend, we better be against it. And so what's the answer? We must reach out to those that are lost. We must reach out to the homosexual. That's how you, you need to tell them that's wrong. Don't cook. Don't be in coots. Don't say it's okay. Tell them that it's time to change. Tell them that God loved them. Tell them that it's time to get right with God. Tell them that God can get that spirit off of them. Don't tell them it's okay. Don't tell them it's right. Don't tell them they're okay. Tell them that it's wrong. 
don't start a church for homosexual tell them they need to come to the real church I would want to see them here I want to get them to this altar we pray that demon out of them and get them on the track to recovery that's what we do because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 Paul lists several things that were sinful and he says know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God be not deceived neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers nor effeminate that's homosexuality there nor abusers of themselves with mankind same thing there nor thieves nor covetous nor drunkards nor revelers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God verse 11 but such and such were some of you but you're washed so God can wash the homosexual they were homosexual in Corinth but God washed them there were homosexual that were in that church but God cleansed them you're washed you're sanctified or set apart but you're justified having new standing in Christ in the name of Jesus in, by the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God so God can separate them from sin he can give them he can wash them he can give them a new standing but he's not going to take them to heaven in that way they're not going to heaven heaven on earth would pass away i don't care what your friend is i don't care if he's your mom or your son or your daughter homosexuality if you practice that hell is going to be your portion there is no if or but there's no there's no there's no gray areas just because it's your friend doesn't make it right. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. God can take the tattered life of lying, of drunkenness, of homosexuality, of witchcraft working, God can take that life and turn it around. God is able to take a wine bibber, a drunkard, and sober him up. God is able to do that. God is not going to take sinners into heaven. Heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. That is why we have the Holy Ghost. So people must want a change. And we're not going to let them feel comfortable in sin. Because my duty is to prepare them and present them before God. Amen. So that he can say, well done. If I'm derelict, if I abdicate my, my responsibility and don't tell them that they will go to hell. Friend, all of their sin remain on my shoulder. But if I lift up my voice like a trumpet and show them their sin, then I have... I have I have freed myself. We don't want our kids to be indoctrinated in that foolishness. But that's what they're doing even from kindergarten. School system is perverted. And we don't want our kids to have some false notion that this is an alternate lifestyle. And just because little Joey has two dad at home and little... And little uh, Virginia have two mom at home. We don't want them to think that way. That's nonsense. They, our children must know that homosexuality is a deviant and wicked lifestyle that has to be repented of. And we, they need to know if they live like that and if their friends live like that, that in hell they're going to lift up their eyes. There's no, there's no, there's no if and but about it, friend. This is why I'm not about to, to let people feel good in sin. If we are in sin, it's time to get, there is an old song we used to sing. You better get right with God. Come and do it now. Under the cross of Jesus, where I lay my burden down. Time to get right with God. There is no, saints of God, there's no point in us feeling good in sin. Because there's no good end to that. When we come up before God, one songwriter says sin will stop you at the door. We got to get right with God. We, we, we're never going to let people feel like they're going to heaven if they're in sin. You should not because your blood is going to be required. It's going to be on your shoulder. So never let people feel doing wrong that they are going to heaven. You need to lift up your voice. Why did you think they crucified Jesus? Because he testified their works were not good. 
The Bible says, yea, all those that will live godly will suffer persecution. That's Timothy. And so don't feel like that, that the apostolic, that people are not going to say some, well, you're, you're the, you feel like you're the last of the righteous. And then it, when they say that to me, I said, yeah, I'm, I'm part of the last, last, last righteous. So I'm, I'm not taking that as, a, as derogatory. I'm, I'm just accepting it. Oh, you think you're part of the righteous? Oh, yes, friend. Thank you. God bless you. For, God bless you for saying that. Hallelujah. Let's stand. I love you all. We need to be, we need to be, we need to be resolute on this thing. We need to, scripture speak with one's voice. We love those that are outside. We want them to get right. We love that those that are away from truth. We want them to get truth. We want them to embrace truth. We want to love God. We want them to fall in love with Jesus. We want them to say, yes, Lord. I've got this in me, but I know there's power. 